in 1798, the famous Napoleon Bonaparte invaded Egypt. And, according to legend, he would have said, Soldats, songez que de eux de ces pyramides, 40 siècles d'histoire vous contemple. Ancient Egypt was, well, ancient. In fact, Cleopatra was born closer to the invention of your computer than the building of the Great Pyramids. Finding the origins of this civilization is a very complex task. But before imposing the materialistic and skeptical view of our glorious time, let's try to imagine what a priest of the New Kingdom would have answered. He would probably claim it that in the beginning, Egypt was ruled by a dynasty of gods. First Ra, then Shu, Geb, Osiris, Set, Horus, Tot, Maat. And one day, they simply leave, left him a half human, half god, as the new king. And to our surprise, it would stop there. No comment regarding why the gods live, or the fact that this story seems to be centuries old, but he claims that the king at the end is the same, that the one sitting on the throne. Time seems to have passed, but basically nothing had changed. Was he crazy? Ignorant? To the 21th century? Maybe. But for him, it was only basic logic. And we can understand him. But for that, we must go back to a time when history was only a dream. In the beginning, there was only Nun, a notion with of end or order. And then, after billions of years, an island appeared, and land began to take form. The sea gradually recedes, leaving the Nile to cross the valleys. To the south, the Nile ran through an arid desert that one day would be known as the land of the people of Kush. And in the north, where the waters of the river join those of the sea, we find the Delta, a marshy region home to many dangerous animals, but also the source of the vertebra of Egyptian culture, papyrus. Finally, around this African oasis, desert took place to the east and west, Celtic lands that the Egyptians will call the Red Lands, the domain of Set. Who were the first inhabitants of Nile Valley, none can tell. But it seems that the Egyptian population was quite mixed between 46,000 BC and 4,000 BC. Nomadic tribes came from north, south and west and apparently integrated without much violence with the local population over the centuries. The Nile is a rich source of food, however, to be able to enjoy it takes a lot of organization and teamwork. This encouraged the creation of hierarchical communities. A small clay house got bigger and more comfortable, and the discovery of tools and ceramics helped humanity impose its will on the wilderness. Religion also begins to take shape. Historians have found a tomb of a hunter with his bow and arrow, which apparently would be useful in another life. Death is no longer an end, but a transition. For the ancient Egyptians, the world was ruled by ancestral powers, each with their own will and nature. They 
were called the Nechehu, and this word is often translated as God, even if the translation is not truly correct. In an attempt to personify these complex metaphysical ideas, people look to nature looking for animals with similar attributes to the Nechehu. So, the road opener, an ancestral god of death with Vawit, was associated with jackals who were always close to cemeteries. The furious Sekhmet was associated with lioness and the kind Hathor with cows. Each community had his main deity that created everything and a pantheon. But in the south, a god was gaining much popularity. A god who will change the history of the land. Horus, the falcon. Early Egyptians were not ignorant of trade. Although the land around the Nile was fertile, it was also poor on minerals. So, Merchant's expeditions were sent south and west, even if some of those had more military than economic objectives. This was Egypt before the Age of Kings. Many small communities with similar cultures and beliefs, but not unified. We know that there was a feeling of identification between Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt, because each one had a different protecting deity. However, it is complicated to know what were the relations between those two. And of time, these small communities began to compete for land and resources, creating a period of chaos. But on those times of violence, a man would arise, not a simple tribal chief but a king, the Scorpion King. Uh, no, 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 not this one. Yes, this one, this one. From where he came, his reign, and even his name are shrouded in mystery. In fact, there are even historians who claim that he was not a man, but rather a dynasty. The only evidence of his life is a club head founded in the ruins of a temple. However, this relic tells us a lot. The Scorpion King appears as a giant. His size distinguishes him from other men. His nature is superior. Indeed, this will become a classic element of Egyptian art. The king will always be represented this way. The upper registers offer a parade of standards of the scorpion armies, each with a hanged lapwing. Those birds of the marshes were originally used to refer to the people of Lower Egypt, so this scene may be an illusion for a probable victory of the scorpion king over the delta. We can also find bows with hanging symbols. The nine arcs symbolized all the powers outside Egypt. The whole upper register would, therefore, represent in an allegorical way the victory of the Scorpion King over the populations of the Delta and a certain number of outside countries. Finally, let's go back to our protagonist. Despite the military connotations of the mace, the scorpion himself is not represented as a warrior. He carries working tools, and even if it is not known, whatever he will start the construction of a temple, a city, or a sewing ceremony, the image of the worker king is another element that will be constant in Egyptian iconography. So, what is the story that can be drawn from all these elements? The Scorpion King was an ambitious lord of the south. He sent numerous military expeditions to the north and other countries. However, he did not want to be simply known as a conqueror, but as a builder. Alas, if he dreamed of unification, he failed for unknown reasons. But his ambition was not in vain. We cannot establish the borders of his kingdom. 
but he seemed to be very prosperous. There are even clues that indicate the existence of trade routes with Mesopotamia. It's also around this time that writing, calendars and techniques for predicting the Nile cycles will begin to take shape. The Scorpion King was not the only ruler of this time. Others who appear before and after him, men like Iri Horus, King Ka, who apparently created the first tax in history, Aha, among others. Alas, it is impossible to establish a chronology. However, none were as well succeeded like the Scorpion. Maybe Egypt was not yet ready to be unified. Maybe his dream was too big for one man, or maybe the right man was not born yet. No one will ever know what were the last thoughts of the Scorpion King. Maybe he was satisfied with his work and knew deep down that he would never be forgotten. Or maybe he was frustrated because he had not completed his ambition in life. Egypt was still broken. But what we know that his dream will not die with him. A new king will arise to fulfill it. King Namer. He has come to us. He has taken the land of the well. The double crown is placed on his head. He has come. He has united the two lands. He has joined the kingdom of the upper land with the lower. He has come. He has ruled Egypt. He has placed the desert in his power. He has come, he has protected the two lands, he has given peace in the two regions. He has come, he has made Egypt to live, he has destroyed its afflictions. He has come, we bring up our children. We bury our aged by his good favor. He has come to us. He has come to us. Once again, the origins of a protagonist are buried in mystery. According to later source, he was originally from Tijeni, the capital of the Scorpion King and his descendants. But some historians wonder if he is not from Nekham, a city known for its cult of the god Horus, and where we have found many traces of his reign. Among these the most famous is undoubtedly the Narmer Palette, the only clue we have of how Egypt was unified. There is still a great debate among historians as to whether the palette was created to mark a great military victory 
or if it served to be a visual metaphor for the king's role as protector of the kingdom. Either way, everyone agrees that a palette conveys a message that we can try to understand. Let's start with the most famous scene of the composition. In the center, Namer wears the white hadjet crown, symbol of his power over Upper Egypt. He is also to the point of crushing his enemy head, as he stands over the corpse of other opponents of his helm. However, despite the violence of his act, his expression is devoid of any sadism or anger. He is not going to commit an aggression, but a ritual who restored the will of the gods, disturbed by those who intervened against him. Speaking of them, they are also present in the palette. The falcon god Horus stand on a papyrus flower, plant widely found in Lower Egypt. In his claws, he holds a hope-like object, which appears to be attached to a nose of a man's head, indicating perhaps that he is drawing life from the head. At the top, the king's name is protected by two representations of the co goddess Hathor, whose name means the House of Horus. We can also find other elements that will become iconic in Egyptian iconography. The king wears a false beard, a symbol of wisdom, and a belt in the shape of a tail of a lion or a taurus symbol of power. Finally, behind the king, a servant brings his sandals, a very luxurious item at the time. Strength, wisdom and power, those are the attributes of a true king. On the other side of the palette, we can find an armor wearing Deshet, the red crown of Lower Egypt, and a parade of his victorious troops. The beheaded corpses of their enemies are also on display. The larger scene on this side is pretty mysterious. Two strange long necked creatures are tamed by ropes. Some interpret the image as the unification of the two lands, others as the power of the king being capable of controlling the chaos of the cosmos. Finally, we can find Nahmer again, but this time he has taken the form of a bull, which crushes its enemies and destroys the walls of a city. Nothing can stop his power. This palette is iconic. But did the unification happen only to violence, like this image seems to indicate? One name seems to contradict this theory. Nif Hotep, Egypt's first queen and wife of Narmer. She was named in homage of the goddess Nif, which was very popular in the north. Perhaps his marriage was a means to bring together the two royal families. So, what can we conclude? Narmer was the one who finished the work of the scorpion finalizing the conquest of the north and stabilizing his power. However, another mystery surrounds Nermer. Why, in the king lists created by Egyptians with the name of all the sovereigns of Egypt, the first one is always called Menes. The most accepted theory is that Menes and Nermer are the same person. The word Menes means he who endures, which could be a title, or an indication that the office of king was greater than individual. The man seated on the throne is mortal, but his office is eternal. Unifying Egypt was only the beginning for Namer. He decided that his kingdom needed a new capital. The famous city of Inebu Hedju was his choice. According to legend, he was the founder of the capital, whose name means the White Walls. However, in 2012, evidence was found 
indicating that the seat existed at the time of the king Irihorus, two generations before the rise of Namer. Perhaps the first king did not build it from the ground, but reform it to accommodate his court. What's certain is that when he arrived, he dedicated a temple to the local deity Pita. But Inebu Heju, which over time changed his name to Inebd Hej, was not the only Tao that Nemer built. Legend tells that one day the king was chased by rabid dogs and threw himself into a lake to save his life. However, the animals continued his pursuit and Nemer would have died had he not been saved by crocodiles. To thank the god Sobek, patron of these creatures, he founded the seat of Shedet. Economy was not neglected. Ambassadors were sent to Phoenicia, Byblos and Canaan to establish trade routes. Egypt imposed itself on the international scene. Once the cities and roads of the living were built and flourishing, the moment arrived to prepare those of the dead. Around the capital, many mastabas were built to accommodate the king, his family and nobility. Only legends tell us about the last days of Namer. They said that after 62 years of reign, he was killed by hypos. As his son Hor Aha was too young to assume the throne, his mother Nifhotep assumed the regency. After the death of Hor Aha, whose reign was marked by great religious and military activity, the new king Djer followed the example of his grandfather and married a nobleman from the north, Mer Nif, who also followed the example of the first queen by assuming the regency when her son Djet arrived at the throne too young to reign. Even if some historians wonder if Mer Nif would not have fully assumed the role as Lord of Egypt, as Hapshetsut will do a few centuries later. Once a full grown man, Diger would be a great king and his reign will be marked by many innovations. Alas, the reign of his descendant, Anebjib, would not be so blessed, as it was marked by violence between north and the south. Apparently, the king met a tragic end, as his successor and rival, Sermakhat, allegedly tried to erase his name. He will be remembered by history as an usurper. Sermakhat's son, Ka, would be unable to tame the chaos created by his father, giving way to a new dynasty under the hands of Hotep Sekham Wi, then Haneb. Ninetjer and Peribsen, who took the controversial decision to take Set as royal totality deity instead of Horus. His decision was probably made by the increase of influence of Lower Egypt, from where the cult of Set came long ago. But it was in vain. The reign of his successor, Kazehamwi, would be marked by a period of civil war, which ended with a marriage with Nematrap, a nobleman of the north, known as the mother of a new dynasty. But even with this chaotic ending, the descendants of Namer laid the foundations for building a great civilization. Egypt was ready to make a big leap forward. Or, to put it better, a leap to the sky.
when Joseph came into adulthood, the conflict between the north and the south was just a bad memory. Egypt was in peace, and his brother and king, Sanak, married the last heiress of the second dynasty, creating a new one. Nothing is known about his reign, except an approximate duration of 18 years. He, like all the kings of the third dynasty, was completely obfuscated by Djoser's genius. It is with Djoser that a golden age called by historians as the Old Kingdom will begin. In this period, Egypt will know a revolution on the basis of the religion, architecture and culture. Djoser was one of the most celebrated kings in Egyptian history. The royal list of Turin gave him the privilege of having his name written in red. Centuries after his death, he was still worshipped like a god, and his pyramid was a major center of pilgrimage. Such was his popularity that many centuries later, when Egypt was under the rule of the Macedonians, the Ptolemaic dynasty tried to be accepted using the memory of Djoser. Curiously, this great king was never called Djoser in life. His name was Horus Nejeriket, which means the one whose body is divine. It was only during the 12th dynasty, a century later, that the name Djoser will appear. No one knows exactly why, but the most likely it was that Djoser was a royal title that was associated with the man. This word means the sublime, showing us how much his legacy was shared by his descendants. Sadly, despite his importance, we know next to nothing about Djoser's life. At the beginning of his reign, he chose the city of Abju as his capital, before moving for the traditional one of Inebd Hajj. Then, he sent military expeditions to Sinai to gain control over its mineral resources, conquer part of the kingdom of Kush, defeat the Libyans, and married a princess called Hetep Her Nebti. And that's all. This is all we know thanks to direct sources. However, there is a legend about him. A legend that we know thanks to a document known as the Feminist Tale. But before telling it, you must know that this tale was written by the Ptolemaic dynasty centuries after the age of Djoser. And it is impossible to know if this story is fully invented or inspired by a real tale two centuries old. The year 18 of Horus Nejeriket, king of Upper and Lower Egypt, the golden Horus Djoser he speaks. I was in affliction on my great throne, and those who are in the palace were in sadness. My heart was in such pain, for the Nile had not come on time for a period of seven years. The grain was scarce, the seeds were parched, everything we had to eat was in meager. So I looked to turn to the past, and questioned a man from the staff of the Ibis, the chief of the priest readers, Imhotep. Where does the Nile originate? I asked him. What god is resting there to help me? And Imhotep replied, There is a city in the middle of the water. The Nile surrounds it. Her name is a elephantine. Knum is there, like God. For seven years, the Nile has not overflowed, and famine has afflicted the kingdom. Djoser asked the most wise among his priests, Imhotep, from where 
to Nayo originate, and what god can help. After weeks on the archives, Imhotep came back, bringing an important discovery. There is an island in Upper Egypt, an island called Abu. There is where the river takes shape. But for that, the god Knun has to leave his sandals, and for seven years he has not moved. The answer seems clear. Knum is furious. So, to calm him, Joser gives the order to make processions and purifications in his honor. A few days after, he receives a dream. Knum is satisfied, and if he continues to honor his coat, the Nile will overflow again. The miracle takes place, and Egypt reborn. Even if this story is completely made up, it shows us several elements that were associated with Djoser. His wisdom, respect for ancient texts, his piety towards the gods, and the efficiency of his most famous servant, Imhotep. Look what I got! Oh no, by the gods, not again! Not this one! Nope. No. What the hell? Yes, 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 this one, this one. It is impossible to talk about Djoser without mentioning the legendary Imhotep. A man of a mysterious origins, Imhotep was considered the father of Egyptian medicine, a philosopher, and a great architect. His reputation was such that over time he was regarded as the son of the god Pitta, and later as a god himself, associated with the Greek deity Asclepius. And it is thanks to the wisdom of Imhotep that Djoser will be able to achieve one of the greatest feats in human history, the construction of the first pyramid. From where came the idea of building pyramids? We cannot know, but maybe the king was inspired by his name, the one whose body is divine. Because a pyramid is not like a temastaba that disappears after a few generations. It is an eternal place where what is perishable can become eternal. A micro universe where a mortal body can transcend to a divine one. Let's start our exploration with the entrance. In its day, the complex was surrounded by a long wall, sculpted like a fortification, and capable of surrounding an entire city. Many false doors were painted on the walls, and the true entrance was small for the proportions of the monument, 6 meters high and 1 meter in diameter. But the most curious is that for a building that looks like a fortress, the entrance has no protection beyond this narrow door. The explanation is quite simple once you understand the spirits of the Egyptians. These walls are not there to protect the pyramid from an invasion, but to delimit a world from one of eternity. The painted doors are not for us, because they are made for people without a physical body. And the narrow door is like a vagina, through which we will be reborn. Once inside, we can contemplate the pyramid in all its glory. She is not alone. Around her, there are temples, tombs and buildings. The complex is indeed a city for the dead. That, like Egypt, it is divided in two parts, north and south, with the king link between heaven and earth at the center. This is the genius of Imhotep. With the pyramid, the king will have access to a staircase to heaven. His spiritual role will become physical and vice versa. The pyramid also represents Ben Ben, the first island to appear over the primordial chaos, place where the divine created the cosmos. If we enter in the pyramid, we will find a labyrinth of tombs and corridors. 
the decoration seems naturalistic, with stones, rivers and trees carved on the walls. Some rooms are filled with food that will be eaten by the king and his family. But once again, it is not physical part that will be tasted, but its eternal essence. Let's come back to the light. Not very far, a series of chapels guide us to the ruins of a temple. To the empty, but long ago it had everything that was needed to accomplish Hebd Sed, one of the most important festivals in Egyptian culture. It was a ritual where the force of the king would be regenerated after 30 years of reign. Once again, the symbolism is clear. The king would be able to regenerate for eternity. Finally, if you look at the temples, maybe we will see the king himself. The statue is not in a good shape, but you still can feel his proud attitude and his calm eyes of someone who beheld eternity. Even if we know almost nothing about the life of Djoser, his funeral complex tells us that his kingdom was very well organized. We suppose that the pyramid was built in 20 years, duration of his reign, which is very quick if we take in consideration that it was the first time that the Egyptians built something oozing all in stones. With this monument, Djoser and Imhotep created a model that would be followed through history. The Egyptians were not the only ones who built pyramids. But if I tell you this word, it's likely that you will think of their pyramids first. And this is largely thanks to the Djoser. Alas, after his death, none of his descendants were able to follow his example. Perhaps the kingdom was not in a good condition. Maybe the first pyramid cost so much that Egypt could not afford another one. Or without the genius of Imhotep, such accomplishment was impossible. For good or for bad, the third dynasty would be forever known as the Century of Djoser. So, to be honest, I had considered not making this video, because, sadly, his nephew is one of the historical figures that we know almost nothing about, despite its importance. However, I quickly changed my mind. One of the main objectives with this channel is to talk about Egyptian history while respecting their mentality, and his nephew was very very important to the Egyptians, possibly even more important than his famous son. So, even though this video is going to be short, I think it's important to shed some light on this forgotten giant. Let's talk about his nephew, the Builder. Nephru 
is the first king of the 4th dynasty. And, as I commented in my last video, beyond its founder Djoser and its last monarch Huni, we know almost nothing about the 3rd dynasty. And even today, historians have trouble establishing a chronology for this period. Snefru's mother, Meresank, did not have royal blood. She possibly was a secondary royal wife, which explained why Snefru married Hetep Heres, daughter of King Huni, and possibly his half-sister, to legitimize his place at the throne. The young king was an ambitious man, who wanted to surpass the example of the great Djoser. He knew that to build a great legacy, the kingdom had to have strong foundations, so he restructured the Egyptian administration. It is from Snefru's age that we begin to have registers of one of the most important positions in Egyptian society, the vizier. This title existed before, however, it was Huni's son who increased its importance. The vizier was, after the king, the most powerful man in Egypt, a sort of prime minister whose responsibilities were to ensure that the royal wardens were respected to take care of justice, the protection of the king, collecting taxes, etc. Of course, such an important role was entrusted only to members of the highest confidence. Snefru, for example, chose his son, Nefer Maat. We also know that this king reorganized the internal measurement of resources to increase the centralization of power around the royal figure. With Nefru, we have an important foreign policy. At the commercial level, the Parliament Stones report the construction of 40 commercial ships for an expedition to Lebanon in order to bring back cedar wood. This wood, very expensive, will be used to build the new ships and the door of palace. The king will also pay special attention to exploration of mines in Sinai. Indeed, he exploited this region so effectively that he became a local deity there. But this nephew did not only use diplomacy to accomplish his ambition. The Palermo Stone described two military expeditions. The first to the kingdom of Kush, where 7,000 prisoners and 200,000 head of cattle were captured, and the second in Libya, which will take 1,100 prisoners and 20,100 heads of cattle. Such incursions must have been incredibly devastating to the populations of the raided countries. His purpose was to finance his building projects and maintain a large workforce. He organized the country to allow for fewer people to produce food and also developed methods for a large-scale quarry and his builders learned how to make pyramids. The reign of Snefru was a reign of experimentation. He was the only king of Egypt to build three great pyramids. The first one was the State Pyramid of Medium, which must have disappointed the king, because it was never completed. After, he built the Curious Band Pyramid, that had an original slope of 55 degrees, but the unstable rock under the monument caused the pyramid to crack, so the builders constructed a casing around the base and the rest of the pyramid has a 43 degree angle. And finally, we have the Red Pyramid, which had the core made out of red limestone. From where came its name. Oddly enough, even though all three pyramids have funeral complexes, until today, no one knows where is the mummy of the king. After his death, 
his nephew will be known as the model of a wise king. At the end of the chaotic first intermediate period, the 11th and 12th dynasty, who historied royal power, did everything to be associated with the memory of his nephew. And in Egyptian literature, this king will always appear as someone good and fair. If his nephew wanted to be loved and respected as Djoser, he can rest in peace. His son, however, well, this is a tale for another day. Cheops is a mystery. He is the builder of one of the greatest monuments in the world, but the only statue we have of him is tiny. His name is only the most recognizable in ancient history, but we know almost nothing about his life. He was worshipped like a god, but had the reputation of a tyrant. Who was Cheops? A genius before his time or a mad tyrant? We will never have a definitive answer, but we can at least try to better understand the man behind one of the great wonders of the ancient world. son of Snefru, Cheops, who from now on I will call by his Egyptian name, Khufu, must have been around 20 years when he came to power. He wasted no time in trying to surpass his father's legacy. Military expeditions were sent to Sinai to acquire wealth, and the new king immediately ordered the construction of what would be, for several centuries, the largest building in the world, the Great Pyramid. It is assumed that 20 years were necessary for the construction of this monument and, as I have already explained in this video, contrary to popular belief, the pyramid was not built by slaves. Until today, we are not 100% sure how the Egyptians were able to build such a wonder. However, a French architect, Jean-Pierre Houdin, proposes a theory that I personally think has solved this mystery. According to him, an other ramp was used to build 30% of the monument, and then an inner spiral ramp were used to transport the dot blocks to the heights. Inside the pyramid, we can find three rooms, the king's, the queen's and the underground room. Unfortunately, the king's room was looted and no treasure or mummy was ever found. However, it is known that the queen's room had symbolic functions as it never hosted a mummy. Perhaps the king was buried elsewhere or there are secret rooms that are waiting to be discovered. And to be clear, 
There is no evidence to suggest that the pyramids were built by aliens or Atlanteans. None. Nothing. Rien. Nada. And please, don't use this stupid argument that Yes, there is evidence, but the government is trying to hide it for some reason. I have looked at all those conspiracy theories and I can guarantee they don't make any sense. And you believe in this sort of things? <sighs> Sorry, but uh, you're an idiot. Maybe someday I will make a series of videos unmasking these scammers. But for now, accept that the pyramids was built by Egyptians or get out. I don't want you here. <sighs> by the gods, how much I hate those idiots. Anyway, we talked a lot about the pyramid. But who was the man behind its construction? We only have three written sources that speak about Khufu. The best known are the Herodotus records, where the king is described as a tyrant who led his kingdom into bankruptcy and, to finance his pyramid, closed the temples and forced his daughter to prostitute herself in exchange for money and stones. Another Greek historian, Diodorus Siculus, agrees with this version of history and adds that Khufu's name was so hated that the priests refused to pronounce it. Today, almost no historian takes the accusations of Herodotus or Diodorus seriously. We know that for centuries, Khufu was worshipped like a god, and if he brought Egypt into bankruptcy, how did his descendants manage to build new pyramids? The bad reputation that he had among Greeks and Romans probably came from the horror that the intellectuals of these civilizations had against it, the notion of hubris, pride, and the desire to surpass the gods. The other source that we have is a legend told by the West Car Papyrus. Text written during the Middle Kingdom and tells stories of famous kings of the Old Kingdom. By the way, I have better explained the origins of this document in this video. Let's read the tale of Djedi, the magician, and see what we can learn. Prince Hordadef stood before the king and he said, Your Majesty has heard tales regarding the wonders performed by magicians in other days, but I can bring forth a worker of wonders who now lives in the kingdom. King Khufu said, And who is he, my son? His name is Djedi, answered Prince Hordadef. He is a very old man for his ears are hundred and ten. Each day he eats a joint of beef and five hundred loaves of bread and drinks a hundred jugs of beer. He can smite off the head of a living creature and restore it again. He can make a lion follow him and he knows the secret of habitation of the god Tut, which your majesty has desired to know so that you may design the chambers of your pyramid. King Khufu said, Go now and find this man for me, Hordadef. The prince went down to the Nile, boarded a boat and sailed southward until he reached the town called Desnefru, where the Jedi has his dwelling. He went ashore and was carried in his chair of the estates towards the magician, who was found lying at his door. When Jed was awakened, the king's son saluted him and bade him not to rise up because of his years. The prince said, My royal father desires to honor you, and will provide for you a tomb among your people. Jed blessed the prince and the king with thankfulness, and he said to Hordadef, Rain this be time, may your car have victory over the powers of evil and may your coup 
followed a path which led to paradise. Hordadef assisted Jedi to rise up and took his arm to help him towards the ship. He sailed away with the prince and in another ship were his assistants and his magic books. Health and strength and plenty be time, said Hordadef when he again stood before his royal father, King Khufu. I have come down a string with Djedi, the great magician. His majesty was well pleased and said, Let the men be brought into my presence. Djedi came and saluted the king who said, Why have I not seen you before? He that is called Omkometh, answered the old man. You have sent for me and I am here. It is told, King Kufu said, that you can restore the head that is taken from a live creature. I can indeed, your majesty, answered Jedi. The king said, Then let a prison be brought forth and decapitated. I would rather it were not a man, said Jedi. I do not dwell even with Kato in such a manner. A duck was brought forth and its head were cut off, and the head was thrown to the right and the body to the left. Jedi spoke magic words, then the head and the body came together, and the duck rose up and quaked loudly. The same was done with a goose. King Kufu then caused a cow to be brought in, and his head was cut off. Jedi restored the animal to life again, and caused it to follow him. His Majesty then spoke to the magician and said, It is told that you possess the secrets of the dwellings of the god Thoth. I do not possess them, but I know where they are concealed. And that is within a temple chamber at Yunu. There the plans are kept in a box, but is no insignificant person who shall bring them to your Majesty. I will then know who will deliver them unto me. King Kufu said. Jedi prophesied that three sons would be born to Hud Jet, wife of the chief priest of Ra. The oldest would become chief priest at Yunu and would possess the plans. He and his brother would one day sit upon the throne and rule over all the land. King Kufu's heart was filled with gloom and alarm when he heard the prophetic words of the great magician. Jed then said, What are your thoughts, O king? Behold, your son will reign after you, and then his son. But next, one of these children will follow. King Kufu was silent, then he spoke and asked, When shall these children be born? Jed informed his majesty, who said, I will visit the temple of Ra. At that time, Jedi was honored by his majesty, and there afterwards they went into the house of the prince Hordadef. He was given daily for his portion an ox, a thousand loaves of bread, a hundred jugs of beer, and a hundred bunches of onion. The papyrus continues and tells us the story of these children of Ra. However, let us stop here for now. We can see that the portrait of Khufu is much more nuanced than the one described by the Greeks. On one hand, the king is a ruthless man, capable of sacrificing a prisoner to make a test. But in the other, he is described as a curious, reasonable and generous person. He accepts Jedi's indignation and his alternate offer to the prisoner, questions the circumstances and content of Jedi's prophecy, and rewrote the magician after all. Alas, the West Car Papyrus shows us the Egyptians' view of Khufu many centuries after his death, but cannot help us understand who was the man behind the legend. Even the pyramid, his greatest achievement, bears no inscriptions and very little decorations. Perhaps his mortuary temple would be able to help us, 
but unfortunately, he too has disappeared. But there is still hope that one day we will know better Khufu's life. In 2015, a secret gallery, large enough to contain an airplane, was discovered inside the pyramid. We have no idea what is inside and how we'll be able to access it. But maybe the king's mummy and his story await us. The king was dead. Khufu, builder of the greatest monument in the world, was no more. His life was a mystery, but not his legacy. During his reign, royal power has reached its peak. The king was the center of the cosmos, and his pyramid was a testament to his power. No one knows if his death was greeted with tears, rejoicing or both. But regardless, his children try to follow his example and fly as high as the illustrious monarch. However, the one who always looked towards the sky does not see the cracks that appear under his feet. After Khufu's death, it was his son, the Jedefra, who assumed the throne. Alas, we know almost nothing about him. However, we know the location of his tomb, and strangely, he decided to move away from his father and settle in Abu Hawash. We also know that his pyramid was never finished, which seems to indicate that his reign was short. Another mystery surrounding the Jedi's first life is that his son did not inherit the throne as traditions dictated. It was his brother Khafre who became king after him. Some have tried to assume that the Jedi's first reign was marked by a dynastic conflict which ended with his death. It is possible, but his name was not erased from the royal list, as would be the case if he were deemed an usurper. Khafre, barely known by his Greek name Kepre, is much more famous thanks to the construction of the second pyramid of Giza and the Sphinx. If Dejedefre seemed to want to move away from his father's legacy, Khafre tried to follow his steps. The quality and wealth in the tombs of the nobility indicates that his reign was very prosperous. Unfortunately, the only document that tells us about Scafra's life is the writings of Herodotus, where he is described as a tyrant as hateful as his father. But if you have seen my video on Khufu, you already know that Herodotus' accusations don't have much archaeological significance. After Khafre's death, Egypt, we experience a period of turmoil, where apparently two branches of the royal family will dispute the control of the kingdom. Alas, 
this extremely confused period has offered us almost no written sources, which make it impossible to establish a chronology of the events that marked the end of the Fourth Dynasty. Kaume seemed to have returned during the reign of Menkaure, better known by his Greek name Mykerinos, who tried to follow the example of his prestigious ancestors by building the third big pyramid of Giza. Alas, this one was the smallest among his sisters, and he did not manage to finish her, leaving to his son, Shepseskaf, the responsibility to finish the work. Historians still debate whether Shepseskaf was the last king of this dynasty or whether he was followed by the mysterious Dejet Ptah, whom some believe to be an usurper. If you have watched my video on Khufu, maybe you remember a story where a hermit announced the arrival of three sons of Ra, who will take the throne. Uzerkaf will be the first of the three, and the one who started the fifth dynasty. This family, which ruled for approximately a century, brought a period of peace and prosperity to the kingdom. Art and culture develop reached new levels of sophistication, making this period to be known as a true golden age. This dynasty would also see the writing of one of the most important texts in Egyptian history, the Maxims of Ptahotep, a series of advices supposedly written by the vizier Ptahotep that educated the new generations in the way of wisdom and justice. If you are a leader, be gracious and you hearkenest unto the speech of a suppliant. Let him not hesitate to deliver himself of that which he had thoughts to tell thee, but be desirous of removing his injury. Let him speak freely that a thing from which he hath come to thee may be done. However, the biggest change was the social evolution that Egypt was going through. For centuries, the king was the center of everything. Only those who had royal blood could have political influence. But maybe due to the crisis at the end of the 4th dynasty, the god Ra will become the center of the cosmos in the Egyptian consciousness. This does not mean that the construction of pyramids will stop but they will decrease a lot in size, and the kings will concentrate more in the construction of solar temples. Being part of the government will no longer be a privilege of the royal family. Individuals without royal blood will assume their functions of vizier, one of the most powerful and influential charges in Egyptian society. Priest we begin to marry members of the royal family and become more and more independent. Indeed, there are even those who assume that the first king of this dynasty, Ursekaf, was a priest who married a princess. As no man is able to rule a kingdom alone, since unification, Egypt had been divided into several provinces, which historians today use the Greek term nom to define. Each was ruled by an individual, chosen by the king in person. The problem with this system was that the power was hereditary, and over time, new generations no longer had any direct connection with the king or his family. Archaeological evidence shows that during this period, these nomarchs began to build monuments in their capitals, 
the independent power of nomarchs was growing. What were the kings doing? Were they unable to see the crux farming? Or were they powerless to do anything? At the moment, it is impossible to know for sure. But personally, I don't believe in none of these possibilities. The fifth dynasty is a period of transition. Nothing seems to indicate a major internal conflict and the sharing of power was made with the apparent consent of the kings. I also don't believe that the monarchs and priests were plotting to seize power, although almost nothing is known about the lives of the pharaohs of this dynasty, what we know is that they were respected, and their funeral coat were honored during centuries. These changes were natural and necessary, Egypt has grown too big, and the kingdom could not be longer controlled by only one person. However, any change, even necessary, brings conflict. Dark clowns are approaching Egypt. But before the storm, a less dynasty would impose its will, the less breath of glory from the old kingdom. For centuries, a series of mighty and wise kings transformed Egypt into the greatest civilization in the Mediterranean world. While the ancestors of the Greeks founded their first villages and the Romans still were nursed by wolves, Egyptians already built the pyramids. However, the myth of Icarus teaches that the one who come too close to the sun must fall. And the twilight of Egyptian civilization was coming. But before the end, one man will try to delay the inevitable. Pepi the second. As always, it is very complicated to know the events that ended a dynasty. Unas was the last king of the fifth, and his reign was not very glorious. We don't know the reasons, but Egypt experienced a period of economic turmoil. Some evidence indicates that his reign was also afflicted by famine, and above all that, the Egyptian army had to face the Shasus, Bedouins from Palestine. However, Una's legacy is not as dire as some argue. Egypt was able to maintain diplomatic and trade relations with distant kingdoms, and the king was even able to build a pyramid, even though it was the smallest from those built in the old kingdom. Una's diet without having a son to inherit the throne. But nothing seems to indicate that Egypt experienced a period of civil war after the end of the Fifth Dynasty. Another important detail about Una's reign is that it was in this period that the cult of the god Osiris exploded in popularity. The king had already lost his place as the center of the universe for the god Ra. However, his coat was still linked to the royal family 
because the king is the son of Ra. And most of Egyptians believed that only the king had the power to open the gates of eternity for his people. To get to paradise, you must be loyal to the king and nothing else. But according to the cult of Osiris, each individual was solely responsible for his fate after death. The king has just lost his absolute power in religious affairs. The sixth dynasty will begin with Tetite I. We don't know his origins, but he did not have a royal blood, because he had to marry the daughter of Unas, Princess Iput, to legitimize his presence in the throne. Coming to power thanks to his wife, Teti will try to use marriage to gain influence. He will marry his many daughters with the most powerful families in Egypt to try to keep them under control. Although this habit is not new, it is the systematic aspect of Teti's strategy that surprises us. All her daughters were married from a very young age. His strategy was not a total success. The nomarchs continued to become more and more independent and began to build tombs in their lands far from the capital. And despite his efforts to legitimize himself, Teti will be assassinated. The only source that tell us about the assassination of Teti are the texts of Maneton. According to him, the king was killed by members of his personal guard. Alas, Maneton did not tell us why he was killed, and we have no strong evidence to prove his claims. After all, Maneton lived centuries after the age of Teti. But Many historians assume that he is telling the truth, because the king was buried before his pyramid was finalized. After the sudden death of Teti, the throne will be assumed by the mysterious Uzer Kara, of whom we know nothing except a very short reign of two years. Some have claimed that he was an usurper who have been responsible for the death of the former king. And then, two years later, he was finally deposed. However, the fact that his name is present in the royal lists indicates that for his contemporaries he was considered a true and legitimate king. The Egyptologist Nicolas Grimal offers a theory that I personally find the most plausible. Uzer Kara was a regent who assumed power while the young prince Pepi I was still too young to take the throne. The long reign of Pepi I seems to indicate that he ascended to the throne at a very young age. Pepi will try to reuse his father's marriage strategy. However, instead of marrying his children, he will marry himself. We know that he married at least eight times, and it is possible that he had other wives whose names were erased from history. But once again, this strategy had disappointing results. Even if the king succeeded in reestablishing the Egyptian economy and he sent numerous expeditions to conquer Nubia, the wealth brought by his military victories made the nomarchs even richer and therefore more powerful. The reign of Pepi will also be no thanks to a conspiracy in the royal harem. In his tomb, Uni, a senior official, describes how he was summoned to accompany the judgment of one woman who tried to kill the prince heir to the throne. Uni did not tell us who was she, but he let clear that he was a woman of great influence and power. Now, this kind of conspiracy 
should have been common at the time. But the fact that a man without noble blood was invited to participate in this judgment, and in addition had the courage to write the event in his tomb, show us how much the respect towards the king had fallen. After his death, it is his son, Menrerat I, who will become the king. Alas, he does not seem to be interested in creating the political reforms that his kingdom needs so much. Rather, he prefers to follow the steps of his father. Military expeditions are once again sent to the land of Nubia, and although they were met with success, this did not bring much help in re-establishing royal authority. During his reign, some nomarchs will even begin to receive a funeral coat, one of the greatest privileges of the royal family. The reign of Menrerraf I will not last long. After 10 years, the king will find his death, and once again, it is a young child who will assume the throne. The time has come for Pepe II to be part of history. According to Manhattan and the Egyptian tradition, Pepe would have reigned for 18 years, which makes his reign the longest in human history. However, most historians believe that this length is exaggerated and Pepe would not reign for more than 60 years. It is his mother, Aken Saint Pepe II, who will assume the regency during his childhood. She seems to have been assisted by her brother Dijau, vizier of the former king. The start of Pepe II's reign seems to have been calm. After two generations, the military campaigns in Nubia finally benefit the royal family by opening new trade routes to the south and the heart of Africa. A glimpse into the personality of the young monarch can be found in a letter that he wrote to Hirkuf, governor of Aswan and leader of an expedition to Nubia. During his travels to trade and retrieve ivory, ebony and other valuable goods, he captured a dwarf. The news arrives at the court, and the enthusiastic king sent Hirkuf a letter, promise him a great reward if he manages to bring the dwarf back alive. Pepe II will keep his fascination with distant kingdoms for the rest of his life. As an adult, he financed numerous explorations and trade expeditions. However, is not going to abandon the military policies of his ancestors. Nubia will continue to be colonized and the king will have an intense military life because many nomadic tribes will try to invade the borders. Finally, Pepe II will try to create reforms to restore royal power. The post of vizier will be divided in two each half of the kingdom will have an administrator chosen personally by the king. As the viziers were the members of administration the closest to the pharaoh, Pepe will increase his responsibilities and influence. And to appease the nomarchs and gain their confidence, the king will begin a dangerous policy of offering gifts and privileges, such as not paying taxes for his most loyal servants. This, of course, increased their loyalty and motivated the nomarchs to buy the king. Alas, this strategy only works when you still have riches to offer. But for a few years, Pepe's reforms succeeded in preserving the stability of the kingdom.
Alas, when the king reached an advanced age, he was unable to put an end to new crises which afflicted his kingdom. The Bedouin invasions increased it. The treasury was empty because the administration was unable to collect taxes and the nomarchs no longer respected the will of the king. When Merenrat II ascended to the throne, the kingdom was in a total state of crisis. If we believe in Herodotus' accounts, he would have reigned only for one year before being murdered by his own people. After, his wife would take the throne, the mysterious Nicotris. Until today, many historians still debate whether Nicotris existed or not. The only trace that we have of her are the texts of Herodotus. And although he claims that they are based on testimonials of Egyptian priests, he also says that she was blonde with rosy cheeks, which is very unlikely, and that she would have built the third pyramid of Giza. Some Egyptologist claims that we can find her name in the royal list of Turin. However, the poor readability makes it difficult to prove this theory, and other historians claim that they assume the name is just a title for another king. If the legends are true, she was braver than any man and more beautiful as any woman. Nicotris was able to avenge her husband before committing suicide. With she, we finally come to the end of the Old Kingdom. According to the Turin Papyrus, four other kings existed in the Sixth Dynasty. But their reigns lasted one, two, four and two years respectively, and nothing has remained of them except their names. An age of chaos has just begun. And for a long time, Set, God of Storm, was the only to rule over Asher. But even with this chaotic end, this period will be forever remembered with nostalgia by the Egyptians. For then, it was a golden age, when mighty kings were able to build monuments beyond imagination, and wise wrote texts that have served as inspiration for centuries.